function my topic for today is pulmonary function test <clears throat> um, um as we know in as an introduction um uh, presently we see an increase in the incidence of respiratory illnesses uh, including uh, asthma uh, uh, including asthma in such conditions a correct diagnosis is important for the proper management of uh, these illnesses uh, among various modalities pulmonary function tests are uh, considered to be gold standard for the assessment of uh, lung function they uh, they help in assessment they help in uh, diagnosis as well as in uh, 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 response to treatment or uh, on follow up uh, it helps in follow up also to know the improvement in the condition of the um, child pulmonary function tests uh, uh, to diagnose help play a very important role in in differentiating between restrictive and obstructive uh, types of lung diseases dr pallavi your slides are not moving yes sir uh, yeah have you moved it yet no not yet sir okay great no problem okay uh so there are three processes through which a lung functions the lung maintains adequate oxygenation and removal of carbon dioxide from the blood through three processes namely ventilation gas exchange and perfusion there are several tests available to assess each one of these processes Uh, ventilation can be uh, the adequacy of ventilation can be assessed by methods like spirometry peak flow meter helium dilution method body plethysmography perfusion uh, can be assessed by radio isotope technician scan cardiac catheterization and pulmonary arteriography gas exchange can be assessed using abg carbon monoxide diffusion capacity we will discuss each one of them now so the different types of tests are spirometry previously they used to use um, uh, body plethysmography and gas dilution techniques they are uh, they determine the static lung volumes uh, plethysmography is an ideal method to assess the lung volume but it is time consuming uh, spirometry measures the combination of lung volumes along with uh, uh, the derangement of the physiological derangement of the lung hence uh, spirometry is one of the choice of overall assessment for pulmonary function in clinical practice the other methods uh, spirometry also initially used to give time volume loops now we have flow volume loop loops also to know the response to treatment uh, we also use bronchodilator response uh, then there is in diffusion capacity uh, me measuring the diffusion capacity and other indirect methods like bronchoprovocation tests and maximum respiratory pressures before knowing uh, about the spirometry and other tests we will first learn about the lung volumes and the capacities there uh, uh, forces like the outer pulling force of the thoracic cage and the inner recoiling force of the lungs keep the lung distended and that forms the functional residual capacity uh, functional residual capacity of the uh, lung it is usually around 5 to 6 ml per uh, i mean uh, functional residual capacity of the lung now uh, the tidal volume uh, it it is the volume of air moving in and out of the lung during normal respiration it is usually around 5 uh, to 6 ml per kg in infants the other volumes that we see here are um, uh, the uh, the reserve volumes like the inspiratory reserve volume and the expiratory reserve volume inspiratory reserve volume is the volume of an air inspired by forcible inspiration after a tidal inspiration expiratory reserve volume is the volume of air expired by forcible forcible expiration after a tidal expiration the residual volume is the volume of gas remaining within the lungs at the end of maximal expiration the total lung capacity is the gas contained within the lungs after a maximal inspiration inspiratory capacity is the volume of air inspired by deep inspiration 
the first vital capacity is uh, it it uh, is the quantity of air expired forcefully after a maximal inspiration these are the dis different pft machines uh, uh, earlier they were uh, either uh, rolling models or bellow types but the recent ones are electronic and automated using a digital digital turbine and flow sensors spirometry mainly measures the fvc which is uh, the sum of the tidal volume the expiratory reserve volume and the uh, inspiratory reserve volume the this is the fvc is the only one which is measured um, but uh, other uh, components like fev1 fev1 uh, by fvc ratio and the ff the uh, first the expiratory fraction first expiratory fraction between 25 and 75 Uh, person are derived from the FVC. Coming to these components, what is FVC? FVC is the total volume of air that can be exhaled forcefully after a maximum inhalation. It is interpreted in percentage as a percentage predicted. It is the total lung capacity minus the residual volume, basically. first expiratory volume one is the volume of air that is expired forcefully from a full uh, from a full inflation in the first second more um, most 80 more than 80% is considered normal 70 to 79% is mild reduction 50 to 69% more reduction and less than 49% is severe reduction the other components are fev1 by fvc ratio it is the first uh, uh, expiratory ratio it is very important in uh, differentiating between the obstructive and the rest uh, restrictive type of uh, uh, lung diseases the other component is the uh, fev 25% to 75% Uh, that is the uh, forced expiratory flow, which is measured between uh, excluding the initial twenty five percent and the uh, last twenty five percent of the entire expiratory flow. It 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 is nothing but the mid expiratory expiratory flow rate that is between the twenty five percent and the seventy five percent. so this is the um, uh, time volume loop that we have wherein the volume the expiration the volume is uh, plotted against the time so the initial first second is the fev1 and then comes the fvc the if we draw a tangential line between uh, uh, over this curve we will get uh, the points where it meets that is the 25 it will, it, this will be the 25th percent and that will be the 75th percent and this will give you the uh, for, first expiratory fraction of 25% to 75% coming to the flow volume curve flow volume curve is nothing but i'm sorry sir flow volume curve is where the expiratory flow is um, plotted against the expiratory volume expiratory flow is plotted against the expiratory volume this is basic um, um, the initial part where in the expiratory flow increases that is the initial part where we get the peak expiratory flow rate is effort dependent while the remaining part is the after the first uh, first part of the air is expired the remaining part is usually effort independent then coming to the flow volume loops the flow volume loops uh, these are the modern uh, spirometry uh, curves flow volume loops it is uh, here the expiratory flow rate is recorded against uh, the expired volume uh, the total volume total lung volume the expired component is 
is measured in the curve above the uh, um, x axis and the inspired volume is measured against the, in the curve below the x axis the how does it help in determining the how does it help in differentiating between obstructive lung diseases and restrictive lung diseases if there is a reduction in the vertical axis that is the height then it represents the reduction of the flow which means there is obstructive lung lung problem if there is a reduction in the horizontal axis it denotes the reduction of the lung volume and this indicates a restrictive lung disease so we see in 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 an obstructive lung disease the shape of the loop is altered while the restrictive lung disease the size is smaller but the um, shape remains the same so these are the different types of curves uh, i mean uh, which one is acceptable and which is not acceptable so the acceptable curve will have an instant start of exhalation there is a rapid rise in flow to peak flow sharp peak occurring early in exhalation so there will be a smooth continuous fall in flow without interruption slow fall to rv and smooth continuous inhalation to it, uh, tlc and it is reproducible usually of 5% or 0.2 uh, liters a not acceptable curve it will start slow uh, there is a slow rise to peak flow there is a slow late peak there will be coarse flow with interruptions there will be abrupt end to the uh, restal volume and uh, incomplete inhalation this is not reproducible so as i discussed obstructive pattern there will be a change in the shape of the uh, volume what are the obstructive lung diseases uh, the common obstructive lung diseases that we see in children may most common is asthma spirometry in asthma is important because uh, because of the poor compliance and the difficulty in monitoring they uh, help, they hinder the successful management of uh, asthma so all children should be subjected to spirometry for the initial evaluation of the disease if there is an uh, uh, deviation of more than 20% from the predicted value uh, it confirms asthma if the spirometry values are normal then how do we diagnose asthma that is done by a, a, a bron bronchodilator response test uh, wherein uh, the change in fev1 to a, a bronchodilator is assessed if the change is fev1 if the fev1 rises by at least 12% then it in, it is indicative of asthma uh, or else there will be a, the a provocative test like a 6 minute walk test or exercise test can be used wherein a drop in uh, fev1 by about 10 to 15% uh, over the next uh, 3 to 15 minutes is uh, calculated and that is uh, suggestive of asthma other provocative tests that we can use are uh, the uh, histamine um, inhale is, is histamine test and uh, methacol methacolin uh, provocative test wherein incremental doses of uh, histamine are given or uh, methacolin of um, uh, 25 m 25 mg per ml are given and the response of fev1 is seen ideally fev1 decreases by around 15 to 20 percent when compared to the baseline which is suggestive of asthma in copd uh, again uh, here the only difference between uh, uh, spirometry and asthma and copd is that um, in copd the bronchodilator reversibility test may be negative and uh, fev1 progressively falls the other conditions, obstructive lung diseases that we see are bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, bronchiolitis, and upper airway obstruction. These obstructive lung diseases on uh, flow volume loops are basically characterized by low flows with near normal lung volumes. Coming to the restrictive pattern, wherein the size of the lung uh, of the loop is altered, but the shape remains the uh, same. 
the common restrictive lung diseases are uh, basically interstitial lung diseases or lung fibrosis and any anatomical abnormalities like kyphoscoliosis neuromuscular uh, neuromuscular disorders can present as uh, restrictive lung diseases interstitial lung disease the only uh, um, uh, role of spirometry is since the interstitial lung disease is difficult to diagnose uh, 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 on a peripheral setup, they can be treated as asthma or TB for a longer period. And hence, uh, restrictive spirometry pattern on spirometry is um, definitive of in ILD along with other diagnostic uh, uh, parameters like um, lung biopsy, etc. So, restrictive lung diseases are basically characterized by low volumes and normal flows. So, uh, these are the flow volume loops in different conditions. So, in the norm, this uh, first one is the normal loop. Second one is the restrictive loop, wherein the uh, shape remains the, I mean, the volumes are uh, lesser. In the obstructive loop, the flow is lesser. This is the upper airway obstruction, um, uh, indication of upper airway obstruction. In an intrathoracic obstruction, it, uh, it reduces all expiratory flows. And as the uh, uh, reduction becomes severe, there's a scoop or the concavity in the expiratory limb of the loop. In uh, distal obstruction, like in um, uh, asthma, the flows are more affected uh, at low volumes and in uh, proximal obstruction, the flows are more affected in the higher volumes. In um, extra thoracic obstruction, there is uh, 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 flattening or uh, the, ampli the, the amplitude of the lower um, curve is lesser. There is a flattening of the lower loop, lower portion of the loop. Um, and but the expiratory uh, portion is not affected. So when there is a mixed airway obstruction, the ratio of maximum expiratory flow to maximum inspiratory flow is used. Uh, normally the ratio is one. In uh, variable intrathoracic obstruction, the ratio is less than one, while in variable extrathoracic obstruction, the ratio is more than one. So as we discussed, bronchodilator response, this is degree to which uh, FEV1 improves with inhaled bronchodilator. It documents reversible airflow obstruction. Significant response is considered if FEV1 increases by 12% or more than 200 ml. Another alternative is the uh, peak flow meter. Um, peak flow meter it rec records the peak exp expiratory flow rate. Uh, it is the greatest flow obtained on forced expiration uh, after, a, a after a deep or com complete inspiration. These uh, peak flow rates are usually effort dependent and they measure mo mostly large airway function. It helps, it, it plays a very important role in asthma follow up. Uh, any in decrease in PEFR uh, is an early sign of uh, asthma. The only disadvantage is uh, in, during the diagnosis, early asthma may be missed by uh, as uh, may be missed by PEFR as it does not uh, calculate the FEV1. It, it does not co uh, correlate. I mean, it correlates well with the FEV1, but it is not a substitute. Uh, so it can be uh, the early asthma can be missed by PFM measurement. So a spirometry is a gold standard. However, when PEFR is not available or uh, during follow up, uh, a peak flow meter can be used. And the other indirect methods of uh, uh, pulmonary function testing are uh, determination of uh, dead spaces. As we know, there are uh, two types of dead spaces, physiological dead space and anatomic dead space. Uh, anatomic dead space, as uh, um, um, depicted in this diagram, uh, can it, it is the volume of the conducting airway. 
so the usually the normal uh, value is about 150 ml and it in, it increases when there is a traction or pull exerted by the bronchi or the surrounding structure as, uh, as in uh, large inspirations it also depends on the the uh, build of the of the child it is usually measured using the fowler method uh, in this method the subject breathes um, through a uh, Walled box, and a rapid nitrogen analyzer is connected to this box. Uh, I mean, is connected to the uh, lips of the uh, patient, while oxygen uh, inlet is there on the opposite side. So, following a single inspiration of oxygen, the N two concentration it uh, rises as the dead space gas is washed out by the alveolar gas. after repeated inspirations an almost uniform gas concentration is seen which uh, represents a pure alveolar gas this is the uh, plateau which we see here the other method the other um, um, method of measuring an um, physiological dead space is uh, by the by the bohr method here uh, the subject is made to lie down uh, a nose clipped is an ideal uh, method when the subject is asked to breathe in and breathe out through a wall the expired uh, air is passed through a gas meter and into the atmosphere so using the bohr's equation where we uh, uh, use the uh, volume of the dead space and the tidal volume and the concentrations of carbon dioxide in both the expired air and the arterial carbon dioxide we calculate the anatomic uh, dead space no, sorry physiologic dead space other method of measuring is uh, the diffusion capacity of the lungs for carbon monoxide why do we use carbon dioxide uh, carbon monoxide and not any other gas because the transfer of carbon monoxide is limited solely by diffusion and um, uh, it is limited solely by diffusion however the this diffusion is dependent on various uh, factors various factors like the um, area and the thickness of the blood gas ba uh, barrier the volume of the blood in the pulmonary capillaries and the diffusion properties of both the alveolar uh, and the alveolar volume and the capillary blood the diffusion process is made up of uh, the, uh, the diffusion process and the diffusion process is made up of the transfer of carbon dioxide is one thing and the other is time taken by the oxygen to react with the hemoglobin so these two processes they decide the diffusion uh, capacity of the blood so it measures the ability of the lungs to transport inhaled gas from alveoli to pulmonary capillaries it depends on the alveolar capillary membrane hemoglobin concentration and the cardiac output so when do we see a decreased diffusion cap uh, lung capacity of carbon monoxide in obstructive lung diseases in parenchymal diseases and in pulmonary vascular disease in anemia while increased um, diffusion capacity is seen in asthma pulmonary hemorrhage polycythemia and left to right shunt so this is uh, as is shown in obstruction in obstructive lung diseases fvc can be normal or decreased fev1 is decreased fev1 by fvc is decreased total lung capacity is increased in uh, obstruction while uh, dlco is increased in asthma it can be normal or increased in asthma and in uh, is decreased in copd restrictive lung pathology sh shows a decrease in fev1 fevc the fev1 can be normal or decreased so fev1 by fvc can be normal or increased total lung capacity is decreased and again uh, uh, in dlco is decreased or normal in mixed pathologies all these parameters are decreased
other indirect method for measuring the pulmonary function is by measuring the pulmonary blood flow which can be used uh, using which can be done using the fixed principle the formula is the pulmonary blood flow is equal to the rate of oxygen consumption and the divided by the difference between the arterial and the venous oxygen content so as we know there are uh, three lung zones i'm sorry the um, figure is the heading is uh, cut there so there are three three lung zones as we know that as we go upper towards the apex of the lung the blood flow decreases while the oxygenation or the vent, the oxygen the air content increases so in uh, zone 1 we see that pa is more than the the is more than p uh, i mean the alveoli the pressure in the alveoli and the arterial pressure is more than the alveolar pressure is more than the uh, venous pressure in the second zone here it is the arterial pressure is more than the sorry um, sorry in zone 1 the alveolar pressure is more than the arterial pressure and it is more than the venous pressure while in this uh, second zone the arterial pressure is more than the alveolar pressure and more than the venous pressure in zone 3 however the arterial pressure is more than the venous pressure and that is more than the alveolar pressure so based on this we see that the blood flow as the distance increases the blood flow decreases so here because the arterial pressure is more than the venous pressure and there is a negative uh, the positive transmural pressure and this leads to a dilatation so the blood flow is more while here there is a negative transmural pressure and that leads to constriction so when uh, this is for the ventilation perfusion to un understand the ventilation perfusion mismatch better so as we see uh, when to we uh, ventilation perfusion ratio is another parameter to know the uh, functions of the lung so here we see that when uh, uh, there is no ventilation but there is no gas exchange so in this uh, there is shunting here when there is no ventilation even though there is a blood flow while at the other extreme that we see there is no perfusion this is seen in the apex of the lung here there is a dead space created so no perfusion but and there is no gas exchange in the normal vq vq ratio should be around 0.8 so this ratio again indicates a uh, vq um, mismatch so based on the condition of the Uh, uh lung we see that an o2 co2 diagram uh, when we depict an o2 co2 diagram to measure the different to uh, depict the difference between alveolar and arterial po2 here uh, suppose there is um, there is a uh, there is there is no ventilation see the baseline the basic base point here is the x point where uh, there is no ventilation perfusion inequality and all the lung units are represent represented by a single unit so this is uh, point x here that we see this is known as the ideal point that we know now um, as ventilation perfusion inequality develops the lung units begin to go away from i towards both the v and the big i here so so v is a low ventilation perfusion uh, ratio where low ventilation perfusion ratios are there and i is where the high ventilation perfusion ratios are present so the um, this is the uh, mixed venous blood v that we indicate this is mixed venous blood when this happens the mixed capillary blood and the mixed alveolar blood they also diverge from i and um, uh, this represents a constant uh, ex respiratory exchange ratio between the carbon dioxide output and the oxygen uptake this and this is as this is determined by the metabolism of the blood gases
further if we have to you know the uh, we can take the, calculate the ventilation perfusion mismatch or we can calculate this um, uh, inequality of ventilation perforation ratios uh, by calculating the po2 difference between the ideal alveolar gas and the arterial blood gas other uh, physiologic shunting uh, and all can be calculated using the shunt equation and uh, other parameters. But these are all indirect methods of measuring the um, lung, lung uh, efficiency, pulmonary function test. So when FEV1 by FEC is low, it can be low or normal. If it is low, then it indicates FEV1 is low, which is more in terms of, uh, more goes into towards obstruction. We should know whether it is reversible or irreversible. If it is reversible, it is mainly bronchial asthma. If it is irreversible, it could be COPD. COPD, again, if there uh, depends on the low DLC, um, uh, diffusion capacity, it could be emphysema. If the normal uh, diffusion uh, capacity, then it could be bronchiectasis. If the FEV1 by FEC ratio is normal, then we go to check the FEC. If FEC is low, TLC is low, then it indicates restriction. So it, the, if the diffusion is also low, then it is a parenchymal disease. If it is a normal diffusion, then it is an extra parenchymal disease. So these are some of the examples that I have taken. So if we see here is a reference point that we are taking is four here and the measured is 90 uh, is 3.8. So it is around 93% of the predicted. If we V1 is 109 and if we V1 by if we is 95, this indicates a normal, normal curve. Similarly, here FEC is 77%, but FEV1 is considerably reduced. So FEV1 by FEC is reduced. It is it goes more in terms of obstruction. This is an obstruction curve for obstructive lung pathology. Here, as we see, FVC is reduced 54%, it is, and FEV1 is also reduced. FEV1 by FVC can be in restrictive pathology as, as previously told, FEV1 by FVC can be normal since both are reduced or it could be supranaturally increased. So this indicates a case of restrictive, uh, uh, a flow volume loop of a restrictive lung disease. A reversible lung disease, as uh, we have indicated here, reversible obstruction, FEC, initially is 71%, 71 of the predicted. FEV1 is 48% of the predicted. FEV1 by FEC is 58%. So we see that it is an obstructive pathology. After bronchodilator challenge or bronchodilator response, we see that there is an increase in the FEV1 from 1.85 to 2.19. So this is a, a, a loop suggesting a reversible obstruction. Here, as we see that the FEV1 has not increased much when compared to the initial one after the bronchodilator uh, is, uh, after the bronchodilator is given hence it is an irreversible obstructive so if we see the curves have improved but here there is no improvement in the curves the other one is minimal reversible obstruction again we see the change is there but the fev1 uh, the FE, FEC or the FEV1 have not considerably increased. So coming to restrictive lung disease, FEC is reduced here. It is 59% of the total one. FEV1 is 74. FEC by FE, FEV1 by FEC is 99. Total lung capacity is 67%. Here DLCO is 63. So as we see, FEC and FEC1, FEC and FEV1 were both reduced, but FEV1 by FEC is normal. And DLCO is again 63, so it goes more in terms of lung restrictive lung disease. If we see FEV1 uh, here, uh, I, as we see in the in the 
diagram as i have shown when if we see tlc are more low it goes more in terms of restriction and if the dlc is normal then it is more in terms of extra parenchymal illness so here we see that the dlc is almost normal so it goes more in terms of extra parenchymal restriction If we again, this is just a, um, a diagram. The amplitude is restricted. It is there's a, a some amount of change in the shape. It goes more in terms of obstructive illness. So if we see by FEV one, uh, FEC is four. FEV one is two point one. It is seven percent and fifty six percent. So FEV one by FEC is fifty eight. Pulmonary vascular again. If we see. If we see here is ninety three percent, but here we see that the DLCO is affected, so it goes more in terms of pulmonary vascular disease. Again, similarly, uh, again similar to the previous uh, thing. So here also the DLCO is affected significantly. So it it is an obstructive pulmonary lung disease, uh, airway disease based on this. It could be a COPD or an emphysema because the DLCO is very low. These parameters are more suggestive of uh, mixed obstruction and restriction, but however, uh, it is more necessary to uh, measure the ratio of uh, the uh, maximum expiratory flow and the maximum inspira inspiratory flow. And it, if if that ratio is um, uh, is considered uh, to decide whether it is a mixed obstruction or and restriction pattern. Another example is a 15-year-old student who presented with recurrent cough and shortness of breath. A pulmonary function is, test is done. A pulmonary function test is just, uh, it gives if we see as 3.5, which is 100% of the uh, predicted for age, and if we one to 2.3, which is 75%. If we V1 by if we see is 65%. However, on bronchodilator response, uh, it is it has increased. Uh, it is more. It has increased more than 12%. So these are the changes that we see, and this is suggestive more of bronchial asthma. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pallavi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a few points which I would like to add. Uh, not much, but uh, maybe helpful for you guys. Hello, sir. I cannot hear you, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Uh, so I have a few points which I would like to add. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, whenever we do spirometry, we won't be able to uh, look at the residual volume. So whenever we have any capacity which we would like to measure, uh, which has residual volume in it, like any FRC or any total lung capacities, in that cases, spirometry is not the way to go. That is one point. And uh, if you want to put all the restrictive and the obstructive diseases on a single flow chart, uh, on a single graph, for better understanding, this would be a perfect uh, perfect figure. Uh, so uh, when you look at any obstructive diseases, uh, there, there is uh, the flow is affected. So, but the residual, but the residual volumes are normal or could be high on the higher side. Uh, that is because there is uh, dynamic hyperinflation, and because of the dynamic inflation, there could be some uh, air retention. So in those cases, if you can see the lung volumes are slightly higher than the normal, but there is scooping out of the uh, scooping out of the expiratory limb, and also the FE, uh, the flow rates are uh, uh, lower when compared to the normal. But if you look at the restrictive diseases, uh, the total lung capacities are decreasing. So uh, the uh, uh, the graph shifts towards the other side, uh, but if, but the FEV went by, uh, uh, but the flow rates also go down when compared to the normal. So this is a good figure where you can see both obstructive and restrictive diseases on a single graph uh, when you are comparing with the normal. The next point is uh, when you look at the FEF uh, 25 to 75 percent, uh, this usually represents the how the flow expiratory rate is in the smaller conducting airways. Uh, so uh, if you are suspecting uh, any uh, uh, airway, uh, smaller airways which are involved, so in that cases we look at the FEF 25 and 75 percent. 
uh, and uh, as you've already shown all these uh, before, I would like to highlight uh, the changes in the inspiratory flow rates. So, in case of any uh, upper airway involvement, uh, there, there is decrease in the uh, decrease. Uh, uh, there is decrease in the ins inspiratory flow rates. So, as you can see in these three diagrams, there is uh, obstruction near the upper airway. So, in all these three cases, uh, the inspiratory area is slightly diminished. And then, uh, if you are uh, looking at a child who has a bronchial asthma, and uh, if we are giving him uh, uh, bronch uh, bronchodilator therapy, and if the change is less than five percent, we we say that he is not responding. But in case if the change is more than twelve percent, uh, as you already mentioned, that uh, they are uh, they are responding to bronchodilator therapy. But this twelve percent is usually for adults. But in case of uh, children, we usually uh, say a change of uh, more than uh, FEV1 of more than 8% to be uh, significant. 8% sir? Yeah, 8%. Okay. okay. And uh, regarding the peak flow, uh, peak flow meter, uh, I think peak flow meter should be given to every asthmatic child for, uh, uh, for, uh, for looking at the response and also looking if there, if there are any impending attacks. Uh, so we should ideally explain them how to do and all. Uh, so, uh, uh, unlike the uh, unlike the spirometry, we only look at the blast, uh, short expiratory blast, which I already mentioned. Yes. So we only uh, look at uh, so uh, uh, since spirometry is usually recommended for about about six years of age. Since this is a simpler method, we can usually we can also give it for uh, children below uh, between six, uh, four to six years. Yes. And uh, we can also look at some personal best values and then de determine if they are, how they are performing. Yes. Uh, so these peak flow expiratory rates are, uh, uh, meters are usually dependent on the heights of the patient. So you look at the height and then you determine the expected PEFR and then you can tell them uh, uh, how to do. And you have to take three best uh, readings every day uh, and uh, then uh, see how they go about. Uh, so uh, ideally you should uh, prepare a, uh, a diary, something like this, so that you can Tell them the different symptoms which they can come about and what are the different symptoms which they can feel and then make a diary so that uh, when they come to you for follow-up, you can look at, look at it and then you can adjust your dosage. And then you can also give an asthma, asthma action plan depending on the peak exploratory flow rate. So uh, if, if he falls in the green area, that means there is not much change, uh, then you, you can ask him to uh, continue his control therapy. And then if he comes in between uh, 50th of his personal best and 80 or 80 80 percent of his personal best, and he also has these symptoms, then you should also uh, tell him what uh, preventive medications he is supposed to take and how he has to come about. And when he is in the red zone, when that is that is 50 percent uh, less than his best, then you should uh, ask him to tell uh, ask him to take the preventive therapy as well. So you can make a uh, plan something similar to this diagram so that all the asthmatic issues are well taken care of, uh, well taken care about. Uh, and also regarding the bronchial challenge test, when we give methacholine or if you do any exercise or any burst of cold air is given as a challenge. In these cases, you will have to make sure that uh, there are at least two uh, uh, persons who are specialized in maintaining the airway because. Yes. Uh, once you set in a uh, when, once you set in this bronchial challenge and if they uh, uh, undergo any uh, severe bronchospasm, that will be a difficult thing for you to uh, handle. And also, apart from spirometry, even lung volume. Uh, uh, since we already said that residual volumes are something which is not measured by spirometry, yes. in these cases we'll have to do plethysmography or gas dilution. So plethysmography works on the Boyle's law where P1, V1 is P2, V2. So depending on the change in the uh, pressures. You can determine the volumes and uh, gas dilution. These are uh, computer calibrated, and then they measure how much uh, gas is present. Uh, and the other pulmonary function tests, which are available, are uh, this is the one respiratory muscle pressure me measurements. So this uh, uh, this meter can uh, determine the amount of uh, pressure pressure that uh, that they can generate. Uh, so uh, this is usually particularly useful for uh, patients who have any neuromuscular disorder like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So what they do is they uh, they you inhale into the mouthpiece and then you can uh, determine the pressures. Uh, depending on this uh, uh, specific uh, age age specific uh, chart, they can determine how much pressure they are generating. And the other method to determine the uh, function if you have a ventilated child with Diabari syndrome, uh, where you are 
uh, where you are about where you are thinking about winning the child then you can use a usd where you uh, where you uh, look at the diaphragmatic movement so you can use the sonography machine to get, uh, look at the uh, movement of the diaphragm in case of any diabetes in that patient hmm. and the other method like the nitric oxide so if you have a child with any airway inflammation this airway inflammation can result in uh, release of nitric oxide Uh, because of the inflammation, so this infl this exhaled nitric oxide can be picked up by the computers, and this can uh, determine the uh, degree of any inflammation. And the other thing, uh, in case of childhood and infancy, is FEV one is a slightly difficult method because most of the since most of the children are slight have a high, slightly higher respiratory rates, uh, the FEV one constitutes most of the FVC. So in these cases, uh, the newer alternative is. To use uh, FEV in first 0.5 seconds, so this has slightly better sensitivity when compared to FEV one in case of uh, children and infants. So these are some few points I, I wanted to highlight. Uh, I think Dr. Nitin is not here. Uh, if you have any doubts, you can put it on the group, and we'll come to the discussion together. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you.